Uh, first of all, big thanks to all of you for showing up to the third Snowplow Meetup London. Uh, we've got three, uh, three great speakers. Um, and so let's, let's kick, kick straight off with the first one, Danny Sola from Simply Business, who's going to kick this event off uh, talking about near real-time event data processing at Simply Business. Thank you, Danny. Cool. <clears throat> Thank you, Ali. So, yes, what are we going to talk about? I'm going to introduce Simply Business and a DNA team, the data and analytics team. Then we'll explain a bit our setup that is not a, a normal or default Snowplow setup. And then we'll see a couple of examples of what it enables. So we are Simply Business. We are the biggest insur um, insurer provider We've got 400,000 uh, policyholders, and our, our main market are small companies from 1 to 20 employees, so that's why we've got so many of them. <laughs> and our focus and our mission really is uh, to disrupt the business insurance market using BML, tech, and data. And as you can see up there, we've been uh, winning the best company to work for. 2016 and 15, and we are hiring. <laughs> so the data and analytics team, we've got quite a few members here around this area. Can you raise your hands? If you've got any questions about what I'm going to talk about, just ask them or me. So we've got five data engineers, three business intelligence developers, three data analysts, one data scientist, and one director of data science. Cool, so let's get cracking with the, our setup. We've got the trackers and collectors provided by Snowplow. So we've got JavaScript and Ruby trackers for server-side events. We've got the stream, Java stream collector, Scala stream collector. But then here's where things start to differ. So we have our own enrichment built on Spark, Spark streaming. Basically, what we do is we use the Scala Common Enrich project as a library, and then we, outside of it, we just do our own enrichment, our own, we move the data in our own way, basically. For modeling, that is to say, to aggregate events and sessionize and so on, we've also used our own code, our own, yeah, our own SQL jobs and uh, Spark jobs too. And finally, for storage, we use Redshift, and we use the Scala Hadoop Shred classes as a library, though. But that also works on Spark. So you could ask, why Spark? Why don't you use KCL or um, other technologies out there? First of all, uh, is that it's very Spark. The great thing about Spark, in my opinion, is that you can run lots of different workloads on that, you can have streaming jobs, you can have um, job, batch jobs, you can have machine learning and graph workloads. So you just have a cluster and then it just send your apps to run there. It's, it's so easy. As opposed to KCL, for example, where you have to provision your machines, make sure that they're well configured, uh, monitoring and so on. Um, yeah, also it's that uh, the analyst, data scientist, and quite a few big um, data engineers like Python, and um, Spark allows that with PySpark. So now that we've seen the, the setup, let's, let's get on with the, the first use case that we're going to talk about tonight is the Ready campaign. So basically, we started the Ready campaign across the UK. We are broadcasting our ads in three different zones. Birmingham, Manchester, and London. And we tell them to search for uh, Simply Business insurers, Insurance in, and Radio in Google, and then they will get to a landing page. If they start a quote and they buy from that landing page, they'll get 25 pounds off. That said, the, the whole process of getting a quote is quite long because you have to say, uh, what's your trade? Are you a plumber? Are you I don't know, a restaurant, whatever. And then usually it's five pages long. So 
if people are waiting and are filling data for five pages long just to get the discount, they might be a bit discouraged. They can say, am I gonna get this discount or not? So what we came up with, um, yeah, basically that's what I said. So we would have a banner on top of the questionnaire saying, if you finish this, you'll have the discount. And it looks like that. This banner up there says, uh, yeah, the ready offer is up and running. You'll get the discount if you finish the whole questionnaire. As you can see here, uh, there are five pages. So that's why the reason we wanted to have it. So how does it work? Um, so we have down left the quoting app basically is the app that shows the questionnaire, collects the answers and quotes, just showing and displaying the normal web pages. When this happens, we have the JavaScript tracker that keeps sending events, and we have up there our enrichment, Spark streaming enrichment, and we store state in MongoDB. Um, concretely, we store all the events for all active sessions. So we treat MongoDB, we use MongoDB because the main app also uses MongoDB, not for any other reason, but, so we treat MongoDB as a cache of our all active sessions. And then we just put a, um, an API on top of it that queries it and returns an answer. In, in our case, the, the query would be, has this user started the journey through the landing page, the radio landing page? And yeah, the whole process might be, might look a bit complicated, but it just takes on average two seconds and a half for the data to, to be available in this visitor API. That's because the Scala stream collector batches the events for one second. And then we've got um, Spark mini batches that are four seconds long. So in total, in worst case, it's five seconds. Average would be uh, two and a half. Cool. So why is this setup good for us? First of all, because we don't want to, we didn't want to um, complicate our coding app with concepts like journeys and uh, marketing campaigns and so on. By using the setup that we already have, this Snowplow setup, we can abstract that and put all the logic in the visitor service API. We just have an, an API saying, has this guy started the quote from this landing page? So, our Mongo table has become uh, a cache for all of, of all our events, and we can use this cache now to answer a lot of questions. So, if you read um, Alex's book here, it's what we call um, what, what he calls analytics on read. So, you have all the data, and with this data, you can answer multiple questions. It's a bit like if you have all the data in Redshift, you can use that data to answer multiple questions. The alternative to that would be to calculate in the Spark streaming enrichment the question, say, you receive events and you store for this cookie or this user, has it started um, from this landing page or not? So what we're doing actually is we store more data down there, but we can use it for answering multiple questions. Cool, so that's the first use case. Do I have any questions from that before I move on? What size is your uh, data set that you're uh, streaming through? The data set, you mean uh, events a day, or? Um, what's probably what you put into your MongoDB. Right, so we have around 300,000 events a day. So that works, or bear in mind that we are selling insurance. We don't, we're not YouTube, we're not Facebook. People don't search for these things every day. Um, if we were, we would maybe think about other solution, maybe analytics on write, and then you pre-compute everything so you don't have all this data stored. But yeah, it's 300,000 events a day, and our shopping sessions, as, as we call them, are seven days long. So, you know, uh, two million and something events in total. Um, so are you, are you using that data to personalize the experience of the user going through the buying flow beyond showing them the banner that says you landed on this land marketing page. Right. You're entitled to 25 pound voucher, is that? Right, so this is um, our second experiment in you know, dynamically modifying the user journey. And I cannot talk much about the first one, 
but I think it's something that we want to explore in the future. Say, uh, if someone's been reading um, knowledge articles about uh, landlords, you can assume that this person might be interested in that. And maybe you can change images in the website or stuff like this. And we definitely want to try that uh, in the near future. Any other question about maybe the infrastructure also? Yep. Hi. Um, not a technical infrastructure question, but um, it's pretty cool how it works in real time on pipeline. But I'm thinking that you could do the same with a cookie and some JavaScript to dynamically say UTM video and then duplex a div yep. say pretty. Yep. So why spend days instead of 10 minutes? What's the um, advantage of that? Or do you have plans to expand it? Um, I can answer. Yeah. Okay. Meanwhile. Cool. So yeah, that was uh, a concern that we had from many people inside the tech team. And so you're not the only one. But the idea here is that that's... So caching all the events was a proof of concept to prove that this very simple use case works. But now that we have the infrastructure, it, it didn't take that long to, to build, actually. Like, it was a week and a half. By, using, by having this now, we can use this data to answer multiple questions and do things like personalize much more the website in real time. And yeah, we didn't want to actually, um, I meant, oops, sorry, I'm going the other way around. We don't want to mess with the coding app because actually you see one app here, but it's actually in related there too. So there's one CMS for all the knowledge pages, uh, FAQs and so on, and another app for the actual journey and the quote. So you would have to sh share some information. Yeah, maybe client side with the cookie and stuff like this, but this way, um, you don't have to worry about um, modifying client side. Cool, so, yeah. Um, so you say you can query the data in MongoDB. Mm -hmm. Can you give examples of the kind of things you're querying? Because right. I just went through a whole thing where I exploited all my data out of Mongo. Yeah, so uh, in that case, it would be something as simple as give me the first landing page that this guy has been. So you filter by uh, event type equals page view, and maybe the domain is this or that, stuff like this. Uh, if you have a specific event, you could say, I don't know, give me um, the last sale for this guy or the last um, item put in the basket or something like this. Cool. So let's move to the telephony system. So we've got an office in London, and we've got another one in Northampton, which is uh, a call center. And this call center has got 200 consultants that basically outbound people say if they don't finish the journey, they might call them. But also they receive inbound calls if people's got questions or just they prefer to buy by a telephone. And we're using an, an off-the-shelf software for many, many years. But um, it had a set of problems. First of all, it was not that well integrated with our systems. So uh, consultants would have a screen with the, the telephone system uh, software, another one with our system, and they would do actually the sales in that second screen. It was quite rigid. Uh, we couldn't adapt it as much as we wanted to. So we had to adapt to their ways of um, working because it's not just receiving and, and, and calling people, but it's about knowing who's, which consultants do you, do you have there. And each consultant's got a set of skills. So maybe we've got a set of consultants that know how to sell landlord policies, a set of consultants that know how to sell uh, lifestyle or policies and so on. So we have different people, different teams, and you have to assign calls to this. You have to route these calls. And another pain point was these, uh, this software provided reports, but they were daily reports, and they were very high level. So how many calls this system had yesterday, um, how many policies were sold, and so on. But um, at the, yeah, 
back in last year, we decided to, to change that, and we built our own homegrown, homegrown uh, telephony system based on Twilio. So basically, it's got two components. One is the contact strategy manager. What it does is uh, creates leads and kills them. So if someone arrives to our website, puts their telephone, and then continues, and then they leave, that would create a lead. If uh, sometime later they actually buy, this, would be, this lead would be killed. The second company is the voice channel manager, and that's the one that uh, contacts the Twilio APIs, uh, contacts the client browser in the consultant, and keeps all the, all the logic about retrying, what happens if uh, yeah, someone doesn't pick up the telephone, it will reschedule and stuff like this. These two systems talk about talk between themselves using events. So there are events like um, lead created, lead uh, killed, and uh, call attempted, uh, contact um, consultant join a call, and stuff like that. So what we do is uh, we have another consumer that gets these events and translates them to Snowplow events. And because we have the whole real-time pipeline, RRT pipeline, we can, have, we can display this data to the team managers and the whole contact center in two minutes. So basically, that's how it looks. We've got the consultants on there, uh, the two systems, the context strategy manager and the voice channel manager, and then the events uh, through this event translator get sent to Snowplow. Again, the Spark stream enrichment enriches this event in two, two and a half seconds on average. And then with these enriched events get written back to Kinesis. So we have a Kinesis stream, enriched stream. And we have another Spark job that runs every two minutes to batch all these events and puts them into Redshift. And because of that, the uh, team managers in, in Northampton get updated information every two minutes. So actually, they can look at this data and they can see who's working right now, our teams uh, overstaffed, understaffed, they can move people, people around, it's much, much more flexible. That's an example call uh, viewed in, in Redshift as a sequence of events. So we have a call start to the event, um, then a consultant join, and then the call is connected. If then at some point, oh, I've got a pointer, cool. At some point, there's a transaction item, meaning that this consultant actually sold the policy. Then the call ends, and then it, call wrap started is what we call the wrap, wrap time. Basically, consultants will have some time to write down some notes and say, uh, this customer was, uh, I don't know. I actually, I don't know what they do in there, to be honest. But uh, they, they write some notes, basically. And then the consultant leaves the call, and the call is completed. So whereas before we just had how many calls we had yesterday and how many policies were sold, here we can start to analyze actually how many, how long do they need to wrap the call? The call? How many uh, call attempts did we have? So you can see the data is much more granular. You can go as up as you want, you can start aggregating and you, you can show the same information as the old system had. But if you want to, you can drill down and actually see what every call as it happens. So yeah, benefits of, using, of this approach is that by using event sourcing is, by that I mean having the two systems using events to talk to each other, we make sure that these events are not only for analysis or reporting. Actually, this is data that the systems are using. So the, si the people working on these systems are make really sure that this data is correct. Which, which is great, and it doesn't happen with all of the events that we have. So the team managers in, uh, in Northampton now, they have a near real-time view of what's going on in the whole call center. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned, we can aggregate or go as granular as we want, and we are leveraging our data platform, Snowplow Snow Pipeline, Redshift, Looker, and apart from Reusing our infrastructure, another thing that is very useful is to reuse our skills. Like everyone now in the company, in some form or another, uses Looker. So they've got some people who got dashboards, some got uh, 
they analyze the data actually, but it's 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 great to see how they can help each other and share this knowledge. Um, right, so right to the sum up, that's the whole infrastructure. Uh, well, that's the event infrastructure. We have other systems in the data platform, but the event infrastructure looks like this. We have some applications that fire events. These are client side, but we also have uh, server side events. Then we have the NRT enrichment that stores some data in Mongo to provide feedbacks to the uh, transactional applications. But we also have this branch here that stores data into Redshift to be used by everyone using Looker. So benefits of this infrastructure of and yeah, going a bit our own way in, in compared to the snowplow, vanilla snowplow, is that we can do things like dynamically altering the website while the user is still using it. Um, we're just exploring it, but I think it's going to be very powerful. We can provide insights on live processes, see what's going on as it happens. Now, all data is available in two minutes. That's incredibly powerful. You can see um, posts shared on Facebook, how they explode and, and see the reaction of people. It's great. And yeah, this infrastructure now, we can use it for uh, many future, future use cases. For example, you can use, you could, you could use it to uh, instantly, instantly add someone to a remarketing list or remove it as they purchase. We could do abandoned cart emails. So if someone starts a journey and then they leave after 30 minutes, we could send them an email and say, hey, follow this link and you'll, you'll finish your you'll be able to finish your um, quote. And another point I'm, I'm quite excited about is social proofing. Things like when you go to Expedia and you see three people are um, also looking at this um, hotel. It seems silly, but people want to feel that they're doing the right thing. And if they see that this hotel, for example, has been uh, booked 10 times today, you think by yourself, oh, this must be a uh, a good hotel, right? The same thing uh, for for digital stuff or these for these uh, non-scarce things like policies. What you could do is use it for ensure people that they are doing the right thing. For example, if you ask people if they want cover for their tools, you could say things like um, uh, one in 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 five plumbers will need cover for their tools or claim uh, for their tools, and this immediately they see the value of it, right? Or, yeah, I think things like this. So by, by showing that other people are doing this and it's good for them, um, you can provide a lot of value because most of the time, uh, the customers don't know if, if they need that or not. So, uh, yeah, so that was the last slide. Any questions? Are you planning to open source, or because I know that there is some plans to, to create the Spark version of the, the Enrich and, and Shredding, which you mentioned. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I just wonder if you plan to open source it, or maybe join forces on top of the current efforts. Um, so right now, uh, all this infrastructure is quite tied to our use case. Um, so it would be difficult, but we've been pushing every now and then um, patches upstream when we think it could be benefit the whole community. But yeah, I mean, it's something that we should consider more, probably. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any um, kind of aggregation or, or data modeling in, in streaming, in Spark streaming on the, on the roadmap? Doing? Um, so one thing that we found that it's critical and that we're actually doing is uh, identity stitching and sessionization, because from that, uh, from sessions, you derive a lot of stuff downstream. So what we're doing is uh, trying to stitch journey. So if we see someone um, on the mobile phone and then they go online, but they use the same email, we stitch them together. And then we use Mongo actually to store the state for that. Um, so at the moment, it's the only um, aggregation that we do at NRT level. Mm -hmm. Have you 
So it sounds like you're using the real-time data to personalize the on-site experience. Are you using the real-time data either to prioritize who gets called if your agents are making outbound calls or um, like give the agents a kind of live feed about who this user is? So that's, that's, that's in the pipeline and we're working on it. Actually, we have two people there, uh, our data scientist and one data engineer that's actively working on that. So you're right, we are, by looking at what, what people do online, we'll start generating the leads in the data platform and we'll score them. Um, you know, if, if we think that someone is so highly to convert that they'll finish the quote online, we, we just don't, won't call them. But if we find someone that it's maybe likely to convert, but not surely, probably you want to call this person. So yeah, it's in the pipeline, but that involves quite a lot of machine learning and uh, data pipelines and who are experimenting with this. With the spot machine learning life. Uh, yes, well, we're using Python and we're using Spark to collect the data, but not using the machine learning uh, in Spark yet. Yeah. No more questions? Thank you cool. very much, Danny. Should we truck on straight with the second quarter that people want to buy?